Hey guys, welcome back to our Organic Garden Basics series. This is the second episode. If you didn't get a chance to watch the episode from last Saturday, make sure you go back and watch that. You don't necessarily have to watch these in order, but it's good to watch all of them because the information's all intertwined. Now this week we're gonna be covering growing zones and climate, first and last frost state, garden placement, types of growing either in ground, containers, or raised beds, no-dig gardening, and growing mediums. So grab your notebook and let's learn. Like I said last week, I'm going to be adding a fifth video onto the end of this four video series, just answering your questions. So if any questions come up at any time during this series, leave them down in the comments and I will get to them. Um, if not in person through the comments, I will get to them on that fifth video. Now let's get right into the first subject, and that is growing zones. There are 11 major growing zones in the USDA map and many subzones. Um, now, most countries have adapted their growing zones to the USDA. And if you go to my website and go to the frost date link, um, you will find your growing zone, whatever country you happen to be in pretty much. Now, growing zone is important for some things, but for 95% of vegetable gardening, growing zones do not matter at all. So hardiness zones let you know what perennials will make it through your winter. Perennials, shrubs, um, there are some perennial vegetables. Now, most vegetables are annuals. They grow for a season, produce, you harvest, they die. There are some exceptions. Asparagus, artichoke, sweet potatoes, and rhubarb are a few of those, uh, most of those, exceptions. Depending on how severe your winters are, uh, you may have to grow them as annuals, or you may not be able to grow them at all. So for those, you would need to know what zone you're in. But for the rest of them, not a big deal. Now, if you do know what your zone is, mine is 10A, let me know in the comments below. I'd like to see what kind of range we have here on this channel. Now, if you don't know your zone, you can go to my website, nextlevelgardening.tv, and on the homepage, click on this icon, and you'll be able to find that information out. But like I said, for 95% of the vegetables that you're gonna be growing, growing zones do not even enter into it. The really important thing you need to know is your first and last frost date. Now, these are taken from information from your local weather station. Whatever weather station is closest to you, it takes a historical average of when the first and last frost date are. Now, like it says, it's average, so they're not a rule. They are a guide. You still have to be careful, and when you're entering that period, you need to look at the weather forecast. So your last frost date would be coming to the end of winter, beginning of spring, and your first frost date would be in the fall or winter, depending on your climate. My average first frost date is December 20th, and my average last frost date is actually tomorrow, February 14th. Now, to my knowledge, we haven't gotten a frost here this winter, so we may not. Usually, if we get a frost, it's a handful of nights, but barely. So I put together a worksheet, and last Sunday's video, um, what to grow in February, will help you fill that worksheet out. But actually, you don't have to fill it out anymore. So if you already went and downloaded it, there's already an update. But now, all you have to do is enter your last frost date, and the worksheet calculates all of the sowing and planting dates automatically. Um, if you downloaded the first one and did all the work, sorry but I did too. But now we can take advantage of this. Again, if you go to my homepage and just click on this icon, uh, it's at the bottom of that page. Now, a popular question from last Sunday's video that I'm gonna address here on this video is they went to the website, typed in their, their uh, zip code or however you do it, whether you Google your country or your city and, and last frost date, um, and it came up and it said infrequent or no frost. Mind, I'm almost in a frost-free climate. If you truly are in a tropical climate, which means you pretty much have no change in weather all year long, then you can probably plant things whenever 
you need to plant them, or if you want to plant them. If it said infrequent, so just a few miles from here, where I grew up, it's by the beach, we had infrequent, that's probably what it says there, um, which pretty much means no frost. However, vegetables are still going to appreciate, and they're still going to know the cold and the warm seasons. And so you still need to, even if you have no frost, it's probably still getting down into the 50s at night or 40s. Uh, and your vegetables know that. So you can't fool them. So I would still stick with, maybe use my date, February 14th, um, or sometime in early February to put in there to figure it out. Because that's still going to give you a long growing season, but it's still going to uh, observe the cool seasons and the warm seasons, which you do have, even if it says infrequent frost. So I am going to try to keep this video a little shorter than last week's. So if you want more in-depth information on frost dates and that kind of thing, check out last Sunday's video, What to Grow in February. I'll link that down below as well. All right, on to the next subject, which is garden placement. Now, there's a lot to talk about with this subject, but like, this, like I said, this is a garden basics series. Uh, I am going to be doing an in-depth video on the mistakes that you might make when starting a garden. And that's going to be, I think, scheduled for the last day in February. So make sure you're subscribed and ring the bell so you get notified every time I upload a video. So let's talk about what to think about when you are figuring out where you're going to put your garden. So first of all, you got to think about the soil. Now, we talked extensively about the soil in the last episode. So if you watched that, you already know. And if you haven't watched it, head over there after this. But Soil type and pH are very important, and you know why if you watch that video. So if you're planning a, a new garden or you're working on an existing one, remember the old adage, it is better to plant a $1 plant in a $10 hole than a $10 plant in a $1 hole. If you spend your money on your soil, it's gonna repay you. You can spend less money on a smaller, younger plant and put it in a hole that's got good soil, and it is going to outgrow and outperform the bigger plant that you put in poor soil. All right, so the next thing we need to talk about is sun and shade. The more sun, the better. The one drawback I have in my garden in the wintertime, and you can't tell it right now, is that I have a lot of shade. We've got two palm trees there that are shading the garden. The fence shades that. Uh, area over there pretty much the full year, um, but definitely the palm trees in the winter shade probably to right here. So this side of my garden actually only gets about four hours of sun during the winter. For most vegetables to thrive, they need a lot of sun. If you can provide them with eight or more hours, they are going to do amazing. The minimum for most vegetables is about six hours. If you say, if, if something says full sun, it's talking about six hours or more. Now, some vegetables tolerate a little bit of shade, and I will link a video down below that I did on that subject. But just because they tolerate shade doesn't mean they thrive in shade. When talking about sun, sun provides the warmth for all of us. Uh, so what about cold in your garden? Well, cold, it's cold in the winter. Yes, but it also warms up in certain areas in your garden, they're called microclimates, or it's colder in certain parts of your garden or parts of your, your yard. So when you're positioning your garden, you don't wanna put it in the coldest spot. That's generally gonna be the lowest spot in your property because cold air seeks the lowest point. So don't put it at the bottom of a hill because that's where all the cold weather is gonna go. And not only is it gonna get colder in the winter, but it's gonna take longer for it to warm up in the spring. Now for more tender plants, if you can situate them on a south facing wall or north facing in the Southern hemisphere, the wall is going to absorb that heat during the daytime and then it will radiate that heat out at night and keep the area right against the wall a few degrees warmer throughout the night. Now another thing that's almost as bad or worse than extreme temperatures is wind. We get a lot of wind here in the fall and the winter. So if you can, it's important to provide some protection. Now, if that's a permanent protection, like a walled-in garden, maybe a hedge, 
that's going to be awesome. But if you don't have that, during wind, you can put up temporary wind shelters, even if it's just a floating row cover, or you can erect a little wall next to your uh, bed if the wind is coming through a particular part really strong. Now, if it's a wall or a hedge, uh, you want to make sure that doesn't shade your garden. So you, get, you need a good 15 feet from that wall or hedge where you're going to be planting, especially in the winter. That's going to keep the shade from shading out uh, what you're growing. Now, a couple other things to consider when you're placing your garden is you want it near water, a water source. You don't want to have to drag water or drag, you know, a hundred foot hose to your garden. So if you have a water source that you can put the garden by, that's a lot better. Also, if you want to make sure it's somewhere near your compost bin. So when you're, you know, cleaning up your garden and putting things in the bin, you don't have to walk a long way or wheel uh, wheelbarrow a long way and especially when you're bringing compost from the heap to your garden um, shorter is always better all right the types of beds should you grow in the ground or should you grow in raised beds i love gardening in raised beds however i've never had a vegetable garden that wasn't in raised beds now in my house here now at my house here it was a necessity because everywhere that had open ground was shade this, what you see here, was a 20 by 20 foot cement slab. And that's the only place I had to grow. Now, I could have broken it up and hauled it off, but that was going to be expensive and a lot of work. So I decided to just build up. Now, if you have a situation like this, or if you have super sandy soil, or super hard clay soil, or maybe contaminated soil, then raised beds are pretty much your only option. Now let me go over some benefits and some not so beneficial things about raised beds and uh, in-ground beds. So raised beds, the positives are they, they define your beds very well. You can look over here and you can see what is a bed and what is a path. So you don't have pets and you know people and kids running through your vegetable beds, not realizing it, but squishing all your plants. Raised beds offer a longer growing season because the soil in a raised bed warms up much quicker than the soil in the ground, so you can plant earlier. Raised beds offer you less weeds, and the weeds that do come up, it's higher up, so it's less bending over to pull the weeds. Raised beds offer better drainage. Not only are they just above ground level, but you don't walk in your raised bed, so there's very little soil compaction. Plus, you're adding whatever type of soil you want. So typically, it's going to be some kind of raised bed mix that's perfect for raised beds. And therefore, it's not going to compact, even if you walk in it, but still don't walk in it. Once you have the raised beds established, yeah, they're going to cost you some to get them established. But once they're established, they're actually going to save you money. Because the garden space is defined, you're actually going to use less water, less mulch, and less soil amendments and less fertilizer. Raised beds are great for people who have bad backs, like me, or who have disabilities. The higher the raised bed or the taller the raised bed, the less bending over you have to do. It also provides great access for those of you in wheelchairs. Just make sure the path widths and turns are appropriately sized. My favorite thing about growing in raised beds is the intensity of planting that you can do. Because you have a deep root run with very little compaction, you can actually plant things much closer together than the package tells you to. So you can fit a lot more, a lot more plants into a smaller area. Now, all those benefits do come with a downside. And the downside, the main downside for raised beds is the cost. Now, each one of my raised beds, and I have five, they cost about $100 in materials. I provided the free labor. However, you can get by with some two by six lumber, some two by eight lumber. I did a video uh, with my sister-in-law, Tammy, where we put her, her raised beds are made out of two by six lumber. I will uh, link that down below as well. But the real money comes in filling those beds because you're not just going to dig soil out of your garden and throw it in there. I mean, unless you have the most perfect loam soil, 
And even then, I would put in at least 50% more organic matter into your raised bed. But if you have anything other than that, which is most of us, you're going to need to purchase the soil you put in there. Now, you can buy whatever kind of organic uh, raised bed mix you like. I use Kellogg's uh, Organic Raised Bed Mix. I'm not, they're not affiliated with me in any way. They're not sponsoring this video. Um, I get them at Home Depot. I think Home Depot, at least in the United States, sells them nationwide. Now, I have heard from a very small handful of you who have tried Kellogg's and had a bad experience with uh, little bits of trash in the raised bed mix. Now, I've probably bought over 100 bags, probably more than that, over the course of this garden, and I've never found that at all. So it probably depends on how it's sourced. And when you're dealing with large numbers like that, you're always going to, you know, there's always going to be something negative that pops up. So I feel comfortable recommending it. I haven't had a bad experience and I haven't heard from very many of you who have either. When you're thinking about the height of your raised beds, you need to first consider what your raised beds are sitting on top of. Mine are sitting on top of concrete. And so I needed a little deeper. They need to be at least 12 inches deep if they are on, um, they're not over soil. 12 inches is going to give you a decent root run for your plants. Mine are actually 15 inches tall, but through most of the year, as the soil settles, it's pretty much 12 inches of soil. Now, if you're over uh, soil and you're just building it up to give you a deeper run, maybe uh, you've got some compaction issues or any of, any of those kind of issues, um, except for contaminated soil, you definitely want a bottom on your raised bed, and so they will need to be 12 inches. Any other soil, or even putting it over uh, a non-invasive type of lawn, 6 to 8 inches is totally fine. Now, I will say, if I had mine to do over again, and had a decent budget, um, I would probably make mine 24 inches tall, only because of bending over. And that brings me to if you're building raised beds and you have a disability or you're in a wheelchair, set up different objects that are different heights and either, you know, bend over them or wheel your wheelchair up to them and see what is going to be a comfortable height for you. Now, how about width? In my opinion, whether it's a raised bed or an in-ground bed, they should never be walked in. And so you need a bed that you're going to be able to reach across, at least to the middle from both sides. And so in my opinion, about four feet uh, is a good width because on either side you can reach to the middle. Now, if you have kind of long ape arms like me, uh, five, five feet wide might be okay, but I think four feet is a, a good general uh, number. Once the beds are set up and cost is out of the way, the only negative I see is the beds, especially over concrete, they are 100% relying on you to provide them the, the water and the nutrients that they need. They can't send their roots deeper or wider to find that. You've got to give it to them. So just be a diligent gardener when it comes to watering and fertilizing, especially in raised beds. Now, how about in ground beds? Well, the positives are it's a lot cheaper to set up, especially if you don't have horrible soil. Um, so you initially save money, time and labor Unless you have really bad soil, you're still going to have to break your back by digging in uh, large amounts of organic matter into it. And I would say any kind of soil in ground, you still need to work a lot of organic matter into it. So compost, manure, well-rotted manure, not new fresh manure. In most cases, you are going to need to put less water into an in-ground bed because it's insulated from the surrounding soil. So the roots can still reach out in all directions and try to find that moisture. So the negatives of raised beds would be, it could be um, harder on your back if you're having to bend over all the way down to the ground. Um, it's also generally, you're generally gonna have more weeds. It's easier to get compaction because it's, it's easier to step in. Whether you do it just because it's convenient instead of going all the way around it, or if you have visitors or animals who are walking through the beds, um, you're going to get more compaction issues with in-ground beds. You're also going to be, uh, it's, it's harder to control the drainage. You know, whether you're walking in it or not, you're still 
um, having to depend on what that soil is made, made of and how deep that goes. It also takes longer in the spring to dry out and to warm up. So you're typically gonna be planting a little bit later uh, in the spring if you have an in-ground bed. So the final decision on whether you should have a raised bed or an in-ground bed really comes down to you. Weigh the pros and cons and see which side of the fence you land on. There's definitely no right or wrong answer. Very popular now is no dig gardening. And this could probably, and I probably should do an entire video on this because it could definitely use its own video, but this is a basics course. So I'm just gonna go through the basics. No dig is exactly what it says, no dig. That means you don't turn the soil every year or every season when you amend it. You don't dig out plants that have produced and are finished. Instead, you're gonna be adding a thick layer of uh, compost and planting directly into that. And then seasonally or yearly, you're gonna add another thick layer of compost and then over the season, the worms and the other good guys in the soil are gonna break down all that compost and pull it into the soil for your roots uh, of your plants to take advantage of. When plants are done producing, rather than digging them out, you're going to just cut them off at the ground level and let the soil reclaim them. The roots that are under there are going to provide aeration, they're gonna provide food for all those good bacteria and everything in the soil that's gonna break those down just as, just as it does compost. And once that's done, it leaves behind air pockets in the soil and plants do need oxygen in the soil. It's gonna keep the ground from being compacted as well. There is an internet of communication within your soil. Plants do talk to each other. If you haven't seen the movie Avatar, see it it's true well not the big blue people part but the plant communication plants in your garden trees in the forest they all communicate with each other through a network called mycorrhiza just imagine somebody coming into your neighborhood and taking a house size blade or shovel and slamming it into the streets and the sidewalks everywhere in your area that is gonna smash up communication, phone lines, internet, uh, the streets, so travel, everything is gonna be disrupted for a while until it all gets worked out. Same thing is happening in your soil when you shove a shovel into it. It is disrupting all of those, that network of connections, and it's gonna take a while to rebuild. So the least you disturb it, the more you're gonna let all of those good bacteria and fungal connections just get on with their work. So I choose that method personally. First of all, it's easier on your back and you're gonna have a much more fertile and productive garden to boot. Another very popular subject and rightly so is container gardening. Container gardening gives you a lot of flexibility in the garden. So whether you have bad soil and you don't wanna to go to the expense of a raised bed, containers are a definite option. And containers are fun because you can get creative. Almost anything can be used as a container as long as it has decent drainage. I did a video on container gardening last spring that I will link down below, and I'm gonna be doing a lot more container gardening this year, so I'll probably have several videos on the subject. But these are the basics. First of all, the bigger the plant, the bigger the container. And the bigger the container, the easier it is on you. You never want a plant to become root bound. That's when you, you pull the plant out of the pot and all you see are roots round and round and around with hardly any soil. It's not a good thing. It literally starves the plant of nutrients and water. And remember in containers, the roots have nowhere else to go to get the water and nutrients they need. So they are dependent on you. And the smaller the container, the faster both of those things disappear. So what size do you need? Well, for larger plants like tomatoes and peppers, um, five gallons would be the minimum. For smaller plants like bush beans, broccoli, you know, groups of carrots um, or other root vegetables, three gallons might work fine. And a one gallon pot would be good for greens like lettuces, kale, that type of thing. When I do my video um, on containers, I'm gonna maybe do a printable on the website that's gonna have all the different plants and what size container they should be in. Watering in containers is essential, and depending on the size of the container and how many roots have filled the pot, daily watering might be a necessity. If you can add drip where you don't have to worry about it, 
That's the only way I can keep things alive in containers. Remember to do the finger test. Two inches down, if you feel moisture, they're good, don't water. If you don't feel moisture, water. You also wanna fertilize your containers weekly with a uh, liquid organic fertilizer. The last thing I wanna talk about is growing medium. We talked about not using garden soil in the raised beds. That's especially true for containers. Garden soil packs down in containers and becomes very hard and very dense. And you're not gonna get oxygen in there the water is going to basically pool to the sides of the container, run down the sides of the soil and out the drainage holes. It's not gonna pull it into the soil. Now, if you have clay garden soil, it's not gonna drain at all. It's gonna become a soppy, wet mess. Basically, yeah, a swamp that none of your plants are gonna grow in. You wanna buy a bag potting mix or raised bed mix. I use the same thing in my uh, containers that I use in my raised beds, and that is going to be moisture retentive but will not compact. Okay, that is week two. Now, next Saturday on week three, we're gonna be covering warm season and cool season vegetables, seeds versus transplants, seed storage, starting seeds indoors, and which, which plants like that or prefer to be planted outside, types of grow lights, even some affordable choices, and hardening your plants off. If you haven't watched the first episode from last Saturday, again, that's linked down below. I think you definitely should watch that so you have both of these under your belt before next week. Um, also, if you are growing broccoli right now or you're going to be planting broccoli right now, very shortly, uh, tomorrow's video is gonna show you how to grow amazing broccoli like this picture right here. You're gonna see this picture a lot. If you, if you follow me on Instagram, you've already seen it, but I'm super proud of this broccoli. I think it's the best year of broccoli that I've had. So if you wanna learn how to grow broccoli like this, tune in tomorrow. As always, if you got something out of this video, if you learned something, definitely give the video a thumbs up. It helps me a lot. Uh, leave a comment down below or a question if you have one, and make sure you hit the bell to get notified every time I bring out videos, which right now is three times a week. I will see you guys tomorrow.